Sunday. And I would recommend going during the week, which is today, because it's going to be a zoo. It's been a zoo the entire show, most of it, but it's gorgeous. And well worth it. Vermeer is a 17th century Dutch painter, and <clears throat> maybe only 40 works by him survive, and eight of them are here, right? Eight or nine of them are here, which is a, is a coup, right, to have that many. But he's very popular and with good reason, and and the stuff that's alongside it is uh, – every bit is gorgeous. It's just a gorgeous show. So if you're interested at all in art, and I assume maybe you are because you're here, um, that's a show that's worth getting down to. It's, it's just terrific. Um, but we're, we're talking about American art. So we last class talked about Copley and West, both of whom um, were born in the colonies but um, went back to England. Right, so our earliest American art, we have to remember, has this overlap with Britain because uh, America was Britain up until 1776, arguably up until the Continental Congress was done, right, in, in 1789. So, uh, right, there, it, it's not, um, it, it's hard to define American art. And West and Copley, even though both of these pictures were painted while they were in London, after they had left America. Both of them are British, support British citizens and support the British side in the revolution, right? They're anti, they're anti-Americans. Um, they're Tories, right? Um, and even though they side with the Brits in, in every survey, in the National Gallery catalogs, they're listed with the Americans. It's because of where they were born, right? Because they were born here. So uh, what we have with each of these two pictures and what we'll see with others is, is, a, is a great interest in American history. Um, and as I mentioned on Tuesday, American art is very much the history of, of America in a way. And um, I think the idea of this new country uh, it inspires this interest in, in contemporary historical imagery, which is something that we have, really don't see much of in Europe at the same time. Right? As we said, we see European history treated through allegory, treated through uh, either mythological allegory or sometimes ancient Roman history meant to stand in for what's going on today. Right? So it's very different uh, for American art. They try to depict it the way it was. Right? What we're going to look at today is three different artists who were pupils of Benjamin West, if we get through all three. Um, while Benjamin West was, uh, like I said, a British sympathizer, spent most of his active career in, in London, he was actually the second president of the British Royal Academy, which was founded by Sir Joshua Reynolds earlier in the 18th century as the first president of the British Royal Academy, which is still there, right? West was the second president of the British Royal Academy. We're still talking about an American artist. But in many ways, he's also referred to often as the, the, the sort of the father of American art because the next generation of painters studied under him. He, he taught everybody. Copley was a West pupil, right? Copley studied art under West. That's where he learned to paint. And the three artists that we're going to look at today are just three of many who were also pupils of Benjamin West at one point or another in their career. Right? So he's plays this an important foundational role uh, in, in American art. So the first of these three is John Trumbull uh, from Connecticut. His father was governor of Connecticut. Right? I guess it was easier to be governor of Connecticut when there are only like 5,000 people there, right? Uh, it's not as big a deal. Uh, but he uh, around 1780, after the war, uh, Trumbull goes to Europe to study art. This is kind of normal, uh, encouraged from throughout the you know, 18th century, the, the grand tour, which we still call it today, kind of. Go see the great art. There aren't museums to go see the stuff in in America, right? So if you want to see art firsthand, you go. And so he goes to, he goes to France, right, and ends up from there going to, to England, to London. Right. Um, while he was in France, he met Jefferson, 
who at that point was serving as American minister in Paris, right? Uh, so Trumbull meets up with him and then ends up in England, where he he works in the studio of Benjamin West, right? As a studio assistant and pupil uh, in the 1780s. Interesting side story. Um, shortly after arriving there, right, in 1780, um, there was a bit of a hubbub here. Um, the Americans had arrested and executed a, a British soldier for spying. And it sort of upset the fragile relations after the, after the revolution anyway. And so the Brits retaliated and they arrested Trumbull because Trumbull had been a colonel in the Continental Army, right? So he's, he's a veteran. And then they, they arrested him as a traitor and they put him in jail. And West, who in addition to being the president of the British Royal Academy, was also the portrait painter to King George III, right? The official court painter to George III. Went to George III and said, Trumbull's, Trumbull's a, you know, he's a good, good egg. Get, and, and got him out of prison, right? Trumbull immediately came back to the United States, right? Like, I, I'm not staying. And, and, and then in 1783, England officially recognized American independence and things are mellowed out, right? And Trumbull goes back, right? To begin to continue his studies with, with Benjamin West, right? So this is a nice little trivial side, side note, right? That Trumbull spent time in prison as a, as, as a, as a, as a spy, even though he probably wasn't, right? Well, there's a good reason to suspect it. Like I said, Colonel in the in in the Continental Army, he was actually map maker to George Washington during the war, right? So uh, rather well placed in society. Right? Stays there from 1783 when he goes back the second time, right? Stays there all the way to the end of the 80s up until 1789, and this was actually painted while he was in London, right? Even though Trumbull and our pupils that we're going to talk about today are are really more they spend their, most of their active career in America, right? Uh, whereas West and Copley spend most of their active careers there, okay? So Trumbull's working under West in the 1780s. And remember from Tuesday that Benjamin West is, is, is marketing himself as Mr. America, right? I do American topics. I have these pigments that the Indians had given me. My paintings are an accurate insight into what life in the colonies is like. I have trunks full of artifacts that are the basis for my pictures. These are re reportage, right? These are, these are accurate, and even though they're not. But that's how he's marketing himself, right, as the American painter. Right? We, we talked about that when we looked at the, the portrait of Johnson and, and Grongiontier, right? Uh, where the the details here painted again while he was in 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 England uh, of this man who's come uh, to try to secure a position um, are all based on things that he owned, right? And uh, and as he tells it, pigments uh, that came directly from the Americas, right? So <clears throat> while Trumbull's working under West in the 1780s, West with this idea of like, hey, I'm I'm the, I'm the one who knows about America. Um, West comes up with this great idea. Because I know America, and because the revolution is over, and because there is now a recognition on the British side of American independence, what if I did a series of pictures that recounts the history of the revolution? Money, right? Big market for this. So he goes and he starts to work on it, West does, right? But he never gets very far, uh, probably because he's working for the king, right? But he, he, he only starts one of them, and he never finishes it, right? And at the same time he's sort of playing with this idea, Trumbull shows up, and he says, hey, John, why don't you take this idea? It's a money mix. I'll give it to you. I don't have time, Right? So Trumbull takes up the idea of doing a series of pictures. I think there were 18 of them. Is that right? I gotta look at my notes, right? Uh, just find, yeah, 18 pictures that were gonna chronicle the American Revolution. And so Trumbull, in the 1780s, working under West, begins to then, under West's direction, 
take up this new series of pictures recounting the history of the American Revolution. Right? So that's what this one comes from, the Battle of Bunker Hill, which you've I don't know American history from squat, right? I do European history. And I remember learning about the Battle of Bunker Hill when I was like in junior high. I probably learned about it in high school, but I don't remember any of it, right? What's going on at Bunker Hill? But suffice to say, it's actually it's Bunker's Hill, isn't it? Anyway, it's belonging to Bunker. But well, here's the, de the death of General Joseph Warren um, at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it's one of the series of 18 pictures that Trumbull is going to create in order to market them uh, 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 to the public uh, as accurate history pictures of America. Right? Now, the problem is with paintings is that you can't really market them. There's a lot of labor that goes into a painting in order to actually then sell it, right? Who's going to buy 18 large canvases? So what he did is after he painted it, he took the composition, he took it to a professional engraver. And this is the norm for printmaking up until, uh, through most centuries, up until the 20th century. Um, the norm, broken by some artists, was that the actual creation of the print was given to professionals, not to the artist who creates the composition. Right? So going back to the dawn of European printmaking, roughly 1500, a little bit before, the majority of prints, whether it's a woodcut or an engraving, would have been cut or engraved by a professional, someone who does just that. The artist would then provide the composition. Somebody else would cut it. And at the base, you can see there's some words down there. Not only says Bob Bob Booker here, but these are, these are words that say, you know, Trumbull, Trumbull composed it and Mower engraved it and somebody else printed it. Professional that's, not That's how the printmaking process worked with a few exceptions, right? A very prominent exception that they would be engraved and printed by separate, separate steps. Right? So if you go back and look at prints by Peter Bruegel, the 16th century, all of them will say Bruegel drew it, so and so cut it, and Geronimus Fox drew it. So the idea of the painter printmaker, something like Rembrandt, right, or Durer, and there's still some debate about Durer, whether he cut his own block or not. Rembrandt we know did. That's the rarity. That's the that's the extraordinary, right? Uh, Goya, extraordinary, right? The norm was this idea. What, what's going on? Here, okay. So uh, Trumbull makes the first of a series of paintings. The paintings then go to the uh, professional printmaker who then transfers it to the plate. Engravings are, are carved lines in and in using a copper plate. You rub ink into the carved lines and you polish it and the flat part of the ink doesn't stay and stays inside the carved line. So you put a piece of paper on it, run it under extreme pressure and the paper yanks the ink off the plate. Okay. What's interesting is our professional printmakers have Accounted for the reversal process, right? So they had to take this, imagine it backwards, right? In order to get the print coming out the same direction, which is probably why it's easier than a professional, right? So there are many reasons you would, right? Uh, so Gott, Johann Gotthard Müller is the is the professional printer using Trumbull. And because it's a print, because what they what they make is this metal matrix, you have multiple cuts, right? And for print buyers, for the public now, the question is whether it was printed during your lifetime, right? Because you look at the matrix, what if I hand that plate? I just have a matrix print, you know? And that's true for history. Whoever has the plate can make more prints. And so you analyze the paper, find out if it's in the right period. Uh, knowing where the paper came from, and using it, right? Looking at the wear on the plate through time helps us know the original, uh, original print. Okay. So this is a little aside on, on, on printmaking. So um, Trumbull makes the original paintings. Uh, they're relatively large. I don't know the scale. This one's in Yale, Yale University. This is like, <laughs> don't you wish? 
that at the Barry Gallery, we had John Trumbull, <laughs> right? Uh, Van Gogh's Night Cafe, right? At our local, these are the Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, uh, is the original and the print and then made after, but the print can be everywhere. So there's one in the Smithsonian American Museum and there's one in the National Gallery, right? Here locally, and there's others elsewhere. Those aren't the only two, okay? So that's why there's two different museums listed for that. Okay, um, the prints became incredibly popular, like really sold well in London. And they inspired people to want more versions of the original paintings. And so Trumbull keeps returning to the scene again and again through the course of his career. This version is in Boston, at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, painted, what, 30 years later. There's still a desire for versions of this painted by Trumbull over the years, right? So West was right. It was a great idea. A series of paintings documenting the, uh, the American Revolution. There was a market for these, and there continued to be one into the early parts of the 19th century. Now, I had already mentioned that Trumbull was a colonel in the Continental Army. He saw this event. He was there, right, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, which might, you might expect would make his painting that much more accurate. But it's not. It's staged. And there's a couple reasons for it being staged. One, quite pragmatically, he was on a hill quite a ways away from where Warren was killed. Number one, right? He didn't see it close up. He didn't see it from that vantage point. Number two, he's in London. <laughs> it's 10 years later and he's in London, right? So he's going back to accounts of the story and going to dramatize it. So even though he was an active participant in this battle, and even though he was actually there at the time this happened, his work is no more or less accurate than West's with his uh, death of General Wolfe, right? They are both incredibly stagey affairs. Now, before we make that comparison, I wanted to mention one more thing about Trumbull. Um, when West decided that Trumbull was the man for the job, probably because he'd been colonel in the Continental Army. Um, Jefferson in Paris sent West a letter saying, I think this is the perfect choice, right, for the, uh, for the job, right, because he'd met him while he was traveling. So everybody's behind this idea, right? Uh, West from the artistic side, uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, from the political side are, are behind this idea, right? So... Um, if we look at them side by side, you can see that, in fact, it looks as if Trumbull based a lot of this on West's image, doesn't it? That's really similar, right? The arrangement of the figures is almost the same thing in reverse, right? Figures coming in from the left, kind of shadowy at the lower left corner of the picture, light shining directly on the martyred uh, military leader, figures gathering around him. Right? So much of the overall composition, smoke rising in the background, right? Uh, and it must make sense because, again, Trumbull is working in the 1780s in Benjamin West's studio, right? So he will definitely know this composition. And there are prints after West as well. I don't know if he knows the original or maybe he knows a print after, and that might account for the flip that we see in West's work. Now, to compare them more accurately, right, let's look at the painting that was the basis of the print, because we got color to color, and I think it's a little bit easier to read in the classroom as well. Um, Joseph Warren is laying on the ground. He's being cradled by uh, one of his men um, as he's lay dying, right? Blood on the ground beneath his elbow, um, he's about to pass away. Um, if we look at the two side by side, while there's a great similarity, Trumbull's has a bit more action, don't you think? Things seem a bit more violent, 
right? A little bit less like a, a, a stage set, even though everybody, everybody does seem arranged. But the, you know, the flags are flying in the wind. Uh, people are lunging and moving in a way that uh, West's figures don't. Uh, so there's the dying uh, General Warren, um, his follower there with him. And you can see what's happening here, right? Uh, the rest of the revolutionaries are trying to protect him and allowing him to die in peace. But the British, the Redcoats, are coming in, and one of them, the guy with his face toward us, right? Here's a pen. Um, this one here, right? Um, decides... I want him dead now, right? So even though he's mortally wounded, even though he's dying, even though he's laid down his sword, one of the British soldiers decides that he's not done with him yet, right? And he's going to kill him with the bayonet. But what happens is one of his colleagues, who's been identified, right? His name is John Smalls, um, stops him, puts his hand over him, pushes to the side that this is inhumane, Right? Let him die in peace. Even though we are enemies, we are all brothers. Right? We are all men. As does the follower with the long Goldilocks hair. Right? It looks like the cover of a romance novel. Right? They're both pushing the bayonet aside so that Warren uh, can die a civilized death. Right? An honorable death on the battlefield. It would be dishonorable to spear him now. There's no point he's dying. Right? We are all men. And that idea of fraternity, even during wartime, right? The humanity that we all share, regardless of our political differences, is actually a theme that seems to run through all of the images. If we were to look at them all, right, all 18, we would find that, that idea of, of fraternity uh, being a very, very strong one in, in Trumbull's reconception of the different scenes. Now, this is meant to be obviously something that, that stirs us and our own feelings of humanity uh, and meant to be an example of proper humane behavior, right? One that should uh, form you know, uh, an exemplar for us to follow in our own lives, right? And that was normal in, in art in the 18th century, the idea of examples of virtue, drawn from history that provide us uh, guidelines to follow, right? We find that throughout paintings, whether they're contemporary like this or ancient pictures. And in fact, Voltaire in, in France recommended that we look to ancient history as examples for being good citizens today. Right? On the right-hand side, uh, the figures are kind of cast in shadow, and you'll notice he's wounded, he's got a sword drawn, cast in shadow. He, he, he's there really, I think, to help us react to the picture, right? Uh, the sense of awe at this moment of humanity that transcends war, right? Um, and the brotherhood that binds us all together, although obviously not everybody, because you'll notice there's this cowering slave behind the white guy. And in fact, there's one more on the left. And what's odd is that in the Battle of Bunker Hill, the participation of slaves within the army was actually very, very well documented. And quite so. And Trouble doesn't know this. Right? The politics of the day probably didn't allow him to When he was even on his mind in the first place, it's not like he was stopped. He must be considered, right? So they're there, but they're there marginalized. Which is not the case in the actual history, right? So there are again, like uh, like uh, West, there are ways in which he's played with history, and very much like West, he's also very much trying to turn Warren into a into a martyr figure by making him Christ-like, you know, laying at the foot of the cross and surrounded by uh, his followers. In fact, um, Trumbull. I have a quote from Trumbull. Right? Uh, that actually makes this connection between the fallen soldiers and Jesus. He says, those eminent patriots 
who had given their lives for their country at Bunker Hill, remind me of the beautiful language of the Savior. Greater love, love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. Right? That's in the back of Trumbull's mind. Right? That the idea of dying for the cause is giving your life for others, and others respect that. Right? But certainly recalling the words of Christ and turning him to a Christ-like figure is something he's trying to do and probably based on the example of the West. Right? So you see how, in this particular respect, uh, a painting that's not here in the local collections helps us to understand this one better. And this one's not here either, uh, except in print form. Right? Now, Trumbull's series of the revolution wound up with war leading to peace. That was the underscoring message, right? In addition to this idea of fraternity and humanity, the other idea is what's the point of war is that we put it behind us. The irrationality of that act leads us to rational acts. And so the culminating images are the establishment of a rational governmental structure, such as with the Declaration of Independence. Right. Um, this one also, by the way, in, in at, at Yale. Yale owns both of these things. Right. Um, and they're, they're they're not that big. Right. They're I, I the dimensions. Right. It's about like yay. Right. Because he's making them with the idea that they'll be engraved. Right. So the result of war is peace. Uh, the American independence was a rational act that closed out an irrational act, if you will. Right. That replaced that with a new era of rationality. And remember that the American Revolution is often talked about as being this, this enlightenment phenomenon. Right. Now, what we're seeing here in this particular picture is we can recognize the guys, right? Who's the fellow in the back? Kind of in the center. Chairman of the, the committee, John Hancock, for a signature. Yeah. Was there something with the street or one person on either the like one person's foot was on top of someone else? It looks like Jefferson's foot is on top of the guy. Who's the guy behind him? I don't I don't know my black and white readers. That looks like Adams. It could well be, but yes, it, it, it looks like he's got his foot on top of him. That's an interesting thing. Oh, so one of the things that comes up about this is that. First, in order to, okay, so um, there is, there's Hancock sitting there receiving the results of the, of the committee, in order which is the drafting of the Declaration of Independence, because Jefferson's work is the primary author, he's the one who's holding it open, right? And, and trying to verify it, obviously, and uh, Hancock's there. Now, in order to get this right, because he was a Jew, unlike Bunker Hill, which he had a little bit to go on, he went down, and he's still in London, okay, he's in London until 1789, so he's detained in London. He goes down to Paris to interview Jefferson to find out what happened. Right? Jefferson did all sorts of things about what was there and, and, and sits for portraits. Right? So he's got an actual life portrait that he used um, for Jefferson. Right? At, at another point, um, Franklin and Hancock came to Paris and he painted them while he was there as well. Right? On life. Um, and, and so this was the basis of it. And so when he goes back to the question about the overlap. I don't know the degree to which he might have been cobbled together as he had the opportunity to visit the cathedral. So he might have felt for that weird little thing down there. At the same time, these are you know, copied multiple times over. And I won't look at one because, as you probably know, the you who live here, this not only became the basis for the print, but it also became the basis for one of the Lord Sunday declarations in the U.S. Capitol. Right? The U.S. Capitol, original U.S. Capitol, was burned in the War of 1812. And in 1817, the U.S. government commissioned new decoration, new capitals, new decorations. Right? And of course they turned to Trump, right? He made his career with American history painting. Who, who better than Trumbull to be one of the lead artists on the decoration of the U.S. Capitol, right? He ditches the violent war scenes and does the peaceful stuff, right? So this is now translated from this to a 
And I've got a picture of it that's on the side. So we'll see if the overlap is still there. Or not. I don't think there's a difference. It's a curious thing, and I don't have an explanation for it other than that. Yeah, I thought it was kind of like a myth. Well, it's right there. You can see it. It's, it's, it's like a plain picture. Yeah. <laughs> Underneath the table, right? You've got, it's a strange thing to close. I didn't dab you away. Right. If, if I if I accidentally some somebody like that, I'd back away. Uh, but I actually hadn't looked at it all that closely when you when you said that, right? Until you said that, right? So um so there they are, right? Everybody's painted from life as they visit, at least with the central group in. Um, again, it's all staged and embellished because it's based on an oral account, right? And one of the things that Jefferson told him is that you ought to include a series of flags and trophies from the war on the wall in the background. And this is uh, the Pennsylvania State House is where this took place. And there were no trophies in the background on the wall at the time. But Jefferson said, you know, you need to remember what the war was all about. So there are these slight inaccuracies. And there is certainly a way in which um, this is wonderful touch. Look at the slide we just had up there. And I'm just now noticing, you see the, uh, that Hancock is on a, on, on a slight rise. There's a, it comes up the sides. But the way that he's painted it, you almost miss it, don't you? Where the pattern of the carpeting uh, that's on the level where Jefferson and Franklin and the others are standing is, is diminished, the lower level is diminished by the fact that you, you get the carpet sort of, it's like everybody's on the same level, right? Even though he has to sit on a higher level in order to have his head at the right level to make the painting work, right? So he's, he's, he's democratizing the space in the Uh, so Jefferson says to include, like I said, this, um, he became the man. So now I can we see, I can't see in this to tell you, right? It's a pretty crappy picture, but just to give you a sense of scale, right? On, in the rotunda after the, after the Capitol burn, Trumbull now becomes the, the artist for this. And so I'll, I'll double check. And if, if it's, I'll bring it in the next class, right? And see if it's, if it's still there or not. I think I have a better picture of that somewhere, right? There's also a nice website by the architect of the Capitol that has good explanations of lots of these things too. Right, so that's something to check into, right? So again, he chose only these most sedate and rational pieces, not the violent war themes. So these are all now painted and have begun the project of the 18 Revolutionary War pictures. It's all begun in London. And in 1789, uh, probably because of the success of these, Trumbull decides to come back to the United States to make his career here. Right to continue his success, and not only is he going to try to market the prints, and this is the interesting thing about that printmaking situation is that because Trumbull was the creator, he retained some of the ownership, if you will, right? Even though they were professionally engraved and printed, and when he comes back to America, he's going to start selling these prints, and. Um, he would sell them by subscription. So you would say, okay, uh, you know, you could, you, you would, you would buy into it, and you would make installment payments, and he would then deliver them over time. Uh, I, I, I kind of think of it like when I was a kid, I used to collect baseball cards, and you would wait till the next week when the next thing would come out, and you'd get more baseball cards, right? Uh, that you were getting them by subscription, by print subscription. Uh, and in addition to that. He's going to parlay his connections with all these people into a career as a portrait artist, right? And we have a few portraits by him in the National Gallery. Here's Hamilton uh, from shortly after he moves back. Uh, kind of Hamilton. Uh, we've got two different Hamiltons by Trumbull. These portraits aren't made for Hamilton himself all the time. Portraits are made for people who, in America, want images of our, I guess, secular saints in a way, aren't they? Images of our heroes uh, to put in their homes. And many times these are inscribed from the artist to whomever, and not Alexander Hamilton, right? Others who wanted to have their images hung in their houses to show their patriotism and their pride in the new country. And this continued into the 19th century, right? Uh, so two different pictures of Hamilton by, by Trumbull, uh, separated by a decade and a half, right? 
all of the heavy hitters, you know, who paid portraits of back in back in America. And again, for this new market, uh, uh, for this new interest in images um, of our of our revolutionary heroes. The greatest portrait artist of the time was Gilbert Stuart. Um, he's responsible for the portraits of Washington that you know, right? The one that formed the basis of the dollar bill, right? All of the most famous. I've un unfinished one that Nick Cage found the uh, <laughs> found the you know the the document behind in one of the National Treasure movie, right? That one's by Gilbert Stuart as well. And so they tend to take on these nicknames because there's so many of them, and they're so very, very similar. Um, this one's called the Vaughn Sinclair Portrait of George Washington, right? Um, he paints him a number of times. So Gilbert Stuart, um, another pupil of Benjamin West, right? Uh, born in Rhode Island, his father was a Scotsman, right? Scottish descent. So being of Scottish descent, he decides uh, to visit Great Britain, goes there directly before the war and ends up staying uh, through the 80s. Right? Uh, goes to Scotland, Edinburgh, goes back to London and studies under West around the same time. Trumbull's there. Right? Before eventually moving back to America. Okay? Uh, unlike Trumbull, Stuart did nothing but portraits. Right? Trumbull was a history painter who turned to portraiture to further his career. Stuart, who, well, by the way, when he was born, spelled his name Stuart, S-T-E-W, and changed it later to S-T-U. I'm not quite sure why. But in any event, Stuart did nothing but portraits. He, there's more than 1,100 surviving paintings by Gilbert Stuart. Ten of them are not portraits. Right, do the math. 10 out of 1,100. That's 1%, right? Less than 1% of his pictures are not portraits. He's, he's a portrait painter. That's what he does, right? So um, he's in uh, Britain in the 70s, early 80s, uh, working for West, right? Apprenticing, learning the trade. And because art then was not as easy as it is now, in other words, there weren't art supply stores, pre-stretched canvases, tubes of paint, right? Apprentices in the studio were necessary because you need somebody to grind up the pigment, mix it with the oil, right? Stretch your canvases for you. And so part of, you know, our art majors, right? Here. Instead of taking classes at university, you would apprentice under the master and they would teach you all these things you need to know so you could go and make your own canvas, right? That's what both Trumbull did and Stuart did. Stuart's slightly earlier than Trump. Under West, right? They're doing the gorge for him in the studio. Clean up my brushes for me. That's, wouldn't that be nice? Right? Clean up my brushes for me. Or mix my paint. Right? So this is where Stuart learns his trade. Okay? Um, his first independent picture after apprenticing under West is this amazing over life size portrait of William Grant. Sorry about the typo. Portrait O. William Grant, right? So he finishes apprenticeship in 1782. He submits this work to the British Royal Academy for their annual Royal Academy show. It's accepted, and it people go crazy in a good way for it. They love it, and his career is made, right, based on this portrait. And what made this portrait such a huge success is that on the norm, full-length portraits showed people just standing there, posing. You know, animals, right? Or sitting by a tree, right? Especially women would sit and they'd stand. But they're never doing anything, right? And these sketches are not only doing something, but actually something doing something different, sustaining, right? Even though his arms are crossed, he is self-preserving, but he's in the act of actually moving through space. And he's frozen that person, so to speak. Uh, and that was 
extraordinary. It's something that people hadn't seen before and hadn't even considered as an option for painting portraits, right? And, and, and this led to Stuart's acclaim for having innovated in such an amazing way, right? And again, we've talked before, even on Tuesday, we talked about the fact that we're seeing some of these American artists doing things that people just hadn't thought of before, like contemporary history pictures, right? And there's something about American art from its infancy that is, is, is particularly innovative. And I think this remains true in the 20th century, right? We just got done with modern art last semester. And you think about people like Jackson Pollock, right? There's something about a, American painting that's incredibly innovative uh, throughout its entire history. Um, and I think it's because they're, they're, we Americans are aware of our difference. You know, we are of Europe, you know, okay, the settlers are of European descent. We white people are of European descent. But we're, we're different from that tradition. There's something about being America that is about self-creation, self-definition, and not based on the rules, you know? That's, isn't that what America presents to everybody? Like, to immigrants today, it's like, come here and remake yourself, right? That's, uh, that's why we're attractive as a place for people to come. There's not much else we offer. You know, our food's not as good. Architecture is nowhere near as cool, right? We offer that. We offer the ability to recreate yourself and the ability that whatever you do here can make a difference in uh, how you leave this world, right? You can enter it wherever you want, but you come to America and then you can leave it somewhere else, right? So that idea, I think, of innovation is, is, is sort of tied to that, right? Well, okay. So Stuart's work. Uh, how did he come up with this idea? Painting him active. There's this anecdote, this great little story. There's wonderful stories about Gilbert Stewart. But, um, so Stewart is working in West Studio. He's going to paint this. It's going to be his, his breakout piece. He gets William Grant. William Grant says, okay, I'll hire you. And he comes to the studio in London. Um, and and what Grant walks up to Stewart and he says, you know, it's really cold out there. And it's way too cold to sit for a portrait. You know what we should do? We should go skating. <laughs> he like, grabs Gilbert Stewart, and they go out to Hyde Park. They rent some states, and they go skating in Hyde Park. And then Stewart goes back to the studio and thinks, mm, okay, and, and uses that as the basis for the portrait. Right? Just sort of breaks the rules, thinks of something new to do. And that becomes now the basis for the work. Right? So uh, one of our more sort of wonderful and striking works from the National Gallery is one of Stuart's first independent portraits. Right? So he stays in England, all this acclaim coming out of the Grant portrait. Stays there for another decade. He's there all the way till 1793, when he finally uh, moves back to America. And he decides on coming back to Mary. One of the things he wants to do is he wants to get into this market of painting the revolutionary heroes. In particular, he's really interested in, in painting George Washington. He wants to paint Washington. So he comes back, wants to make a career portraitist here, a career portraitist for Washington. This is very difficult in America because in Europe, there are positions at court. Uh, West was the court painter to George III. We're a democracy. We don't have that sort of thing, right? You just have to find people who want pictures. George Washington is not going to have an official portraitist. Right, but Stuart's kind of hoping that he can work something out and, and, and really sort of weasel his way weasel's wrong word uh, work his way into that idea. So he comes back 1793. Uh, he wants to paint Washington. He gets him to agree to paint him. Um, and again, another nice anecdote. One of the things that Gilbert Stuart used to do while he painted people was he would chat with them. He just chat them up while he's talking. They painting, painting, painting. Keep them talking because he wanted to see sort of how their faces moved. Right, and when he engaged with people, he could he could watch their eyes and 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 see sort of how their reactions to words and ideas changed their physiognomy and got to know them more than an object, right? But as a living, breathing, moving thing, and then try to figure out how to capture that within the still image. So as he was painting, 
he would just carry on this rambling, rampant conversation with the sinner. George Washington hated that. He wanted him to shut up, right? <laughs> Look at these pictures. <laughs> I can just imagine George Washington. I've had, look, just, I'm a busy man. Shout out to the paint, right? And there's something about that look that is just sort of kind of a little bit like, Gilbert, enough, right? Get back to the brushes. Well, I paint him a number of times, and we've got a lot of his portraits here, right? Uh, the, the names, I believe, are the names of the person that commissioned it and the persons then that owned it later, right? Uh, thus, the Vaughn portrait versus the Vaughn Sinclair portrait. And what's interesting, of course, as a portraitist, is that they're, they don't always look as good, do they? I mean, he's, he's, his physio physiognomy changes a little bit from place to place. And one wonders the degree to which, since a painting is not a photograph and we don't have photographs of Washington, right, uh, which of them is the real likeness? Is the more official-looking George on the left what he really looked like? Or is the less official-looking one on the right? what he really looked like. And we, there's no way to really tell, right? There, eventually, as we look at his works, there seems to be the development of what's considered to be the official likeness, which is we're getting at with the one on the left. Then you wonder if the wooden teeth just weren't hurting that day, you know? They needed to have them tightened up a bit or something, and that might also account for the different facial structures. But Gilbert Stuart remains the official portraitist of Washington. This is a posthumous portrait. Washington dies in 99, 1799. But there remains demand uh, amongst Americans in the early 19th century for portraits of the founding fathers, right? And uh, Stuart paints, I believe, the first six presidents at one point or another in his career, and each of them multiple, multiple times. We've got about a half dozen Gilbert Stuart portraits of George Washington in the National Gallery alone, right? Because he painted him so many different times. Um, up in the Walters, Wham! is the Walters Art Museum, right? Another of these later and more official looking portraits where the you can see through time that uh, the image of what George Washington looks like sort of begins to take shape, right? And as he paints him posthumously, it becomes more officialized, if you will, right? Less individualized and more codified into this one idea of what George is all about. One more portrait of Washington, a more interesting one than these bust portraits. By the way, in all of these, you've noticed that uh, the dress is, is, is fairly humble, simple black robe not too exorbitant of a rough, and that the majority of images of Washington during his lifetime and shortly after his death are, in fact, rather humble, right? They're playing down uh, status, uh, playing down uh, extravagance and making him look much more down to earth. That in itself is also a very American thing. Right, that avoidance of, of uh, uh, well, maybe up until the 80s, up until Wall Street and greed is good and all of that, right? But uh, extravagant display of wealth through much of American history was was not necessarily something that people praised, right? And even your Pierpont Morgans in, in public tended not to look that extraordinary, right? Um, our last portrait of George by Gilbert Stuart is perhaps the most famous one, a life-size standing portrait. Uh, it used to be in Philadelphia, but in 2001, uh, there was a huge fundraising campaign to bring him here. Uh, so he's in the National Portrait Gallery, the Lansdowne Portrait of Washington, uh, which I'm sure you maybe have seen before. There's a second version of it in the White House. So when you watch press briefings, you sometimes find him in the background. Uh, but it's a slightly different version of this. The only difference is some of the words that are on some of the books down below in the White House version, um, as opposed to the one in the National Portrait Gallery, right? the Lansdowne Portrait. Um, this is intended to show him renouncing a third term. 
So George Washington's two terms in office are over in 1797. And I believe by 1796, he'd already decided he is not going to run again. He's going to establish his own term limit with the idea that he doesn't want to be king. He doesn't want to do this for life. We want to be different from our European predecessors. We should somebody new, right? And so the portrait is commissioned and, and painted to uh, basically say that George is not going to keep the job, right? He's going to step down. Um, and the original commission came from a senator from Pennsylvania. And he commissioned it specifically to give as a gift to the prime minister of England. Right? So that was the whole purpose of the picture. A gift from America to the prime minister of England. This prime minister had supported independence even before the war. Right before he was prime minister. Had supported American independence. And this was going to be a thank you gift. Right, Washington stepping down as president, America forging a new future. Thank you for supporting our endeavor. Right, so commissioned by the senator in Pennsylvania to be given as a gift. Right? The same prime minister was one of the ones who helped secure the British recognition of America. And once the gift is made, there's a huge demand. There are three different copies. I mentioned there was one in the White House. Uh, there are two more, ones in somewhere in Delaware, I think. Right? Becomes a very, very popular image. Now, George stands in front of a table, carries a sword in one hand, has risen from a chair, almost as if to greet us, right? He sends his arm out, and he stood up, Right? And he's looking off over our left shoulder, but it's almost as if somebody has just come into the room, and he's happy to see them. Please, come, right, is his gesture, welcoming them. At the same time, the pose, this one that's translated into a pose of welcoming, is derived from ancient sculpture, right? This was yours, wasn't it? Which one was it? The Apollo Belvedere in the Vatican, right? A really famous sculpture, uh, ancient Greek sculpture, um, in the Vatican collections of Apollo. And you can see that Stuart has simply just manipulated this, changed the foot structure a little bit, to uh, use for George Washington. Now, did, he's not saying Washington's a god. <coughs> it was, however, the norm um, in the 18th century, into the early 19th century, to return to classical models when making modern pictures. The period is often called the neoclassical period in both European and American art. A new classicism coming out of these revivals of ancient Greece. This is actually a Roman copy of a Greek sculpture, right? Ancient Greece and Rome as a, uh, a metaphor for modern history. And so by turning back to the Apollo Belvedere, it's sort of this idea of learning from history, you know? Uh, that history can, in fact, inform our understanding of the modern world, which is this enlightenment idea, right? So uh, he borrows from the Apollo, Be Apollo Belvedere. He doesn't quote it exactly, but there's enough details there to suggest that that was exactly the point. Stuart knew this sculpture really well. Benjamin West had a cast of it in his studio in London, right? So Stuart, working for West, grinding paints and whatnot, saw this thing every single day. He could probably draw it from memory, right? He knew it that well. He didn't have to go to the Vatican to have known it. And it becomes for him a, a, a pose he returns to. Some people have even suggested that the skater is kind of another manipulation of the Apollo Belvedere, although with the arms in a very different place, right? That it became part of his visual lexicon, his visual language, because he had been overexposed to it uh, in, his, in his period working with West. Other artists had already used it for Washington as well. There's a, one of Trumbull's portraits of Washington uh, at the Battle of Trenton. 
And you can see again, he too has sort of ripped off the Paul Bell. Paul Bell. So it had already been the, the, the norm to sort of base images of George Washington on images of the Greek god Apollo, certainly to add to his status. Now, where the meaning of the picture really comes out, however, is in the details. And Stuart is very good at painting these details very, very realistically. And in fact, a number of our American artists are very, very good realists, we'll see. It's something to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, American realism as a, uh, as a style. So directly behind George is his presidential chair, right? The emblem at the crest. But it's important that he's not sitting in it. Because the point is he's given it up. He's going to... The chair is important, right? The position is important, but the position is not him. The position is president, and someone else will fill the chair. So an important part of the symbolism is the way in which Stuart suggests that George is standing up to let someone else sit down. Maybe that's who he's welcoming. Maybe that's what that gesture is all about. Who's next? Who's going to fill this... Fill the seat. Take over what I've done. And in the 1790s, there was, in fact, a fear that this would not happen. Even in America, there was this idea that, <clears throat> that we just fall into a trap. Right? We have this revolution. We've got a new leader now. What did the new leader decide? And this leader had been, remember, Washington had been general in the army, right? What if he decided to go back and get the troops? who probably still loyal to him, and just stay president forever. That's a real fear, right? He's got that kind of loyalty. He can do that if he wanted to. The act of Washington stepping down was, in American history, a huge thing. It was very important for where the country was going to go. Right? And there was a fear that he wouldn't. In fact, that fear was fomented by the fact that that's what was going on in France at exactly the time. Right? Napoleon had risen from the army to at this point become council, first council of France. He's not yet emperor in 1796. Right? But he is parlaying military power into political power. And there is fear Washington will do the same. So this image is a very, very strong image for American identity, American people. He has left the chair, the throne, if you will. Right? The American equivalent of the throne. And he's got a sword in his hand, but the sword is pointing downward. He's not wielding it. It's powerless. It's limp, if you will. Right? And his other hand, the one that appears to welcome somebody, is also Right? Not only is he maybe welcoming, but we can read into Washington's statement here the idea that the stuff that's underneath it is here, look at this. And you notice what's directly in his hand. Right? A pin. So we've got in the one hand a sword, and the other hand gesturing towards the pen. Right? Something to go off and light over his head. The pen lighting over his hand. The days of fighting are over. The days of intellectual, thoughtful leadership are ahead. Right? The active life is behind us. The intellectual, contemplative life is ahead of us. <coughs> so it's subtle but powerful, right? Washington will become a statesman. Washington will become the man who crafts the ideas that not the man who leads it from the chair or from the horse, right? On the battlefield. So this will be my future. Right? This will be uh, the life of the mind. Now, under, as we move our way down the table, you look at the corner of the table, you'll notice that the, the table has a bunch of stuff so you can see the legs very, very clearly. And at the top of the leg are eagles, which are ancient Roman symbols. And 
and there's a lot of Roman symbolism that comes into American ideas, which is odd because Rome was an empire. But early Rome was early Rome was a republic and an empire, and that's the right? And the table leg itself, even though it's carved wood, is meant to appear as a series of sticks that are bound up by that rhythm. Right? So uh, this is also a Roman symbol called the fasces, right? the basis of fasting. And the symbolism for the Romans with the fasces is that twigs are weak. But when you bind them all together, it's strong. Right? So we, as individuals, can't do anything individually. But if we bind together, Roman cause, we can do amazing things. Right? There is strength in community. There is strength in cooperation. That's the message of the fasces. And when we look at old Roman images of fasces, they include not only the bound sticks, they would carry these on a, on a staff or something, right? And when they marched in parades as a symbol. But they also had bound into that an axe with the idea that not only can we do anything when we bond together, but also we're willing to kill to get it. And when the Americans adopt it, they get rid of that empire. Right? That will kill the American empire. But rather than to simply say, we can do anything together. It's on the back of the giant. So the horse on the back of the giant is based on this. Um, it's on, go to the Lincoln Memorial, it's on, the, it's on the, the arms of the throne. Once you see it, once you know what it is, it is everywhere. Right? The fasces. So here it's actually a table, and that's intentional on, on Stuart's part, right? It's not just that the table looked like that. He wants this to be part of the message about what America is. That's the point of the picture. What is America all about? And you'll notice that there are books stacked down here, and there are books. He's got a copy of the History of the American Revolution. You might be able to read that. A copy of the Constitution and the Laws of the United States. Law, Secret Siege War. Same message that Cromwell had in his series of history things, right? All of these things come together. This is America's future. Right? And with that idea, there's this really subtle thing, but out the window there's a rainbow. Right? The rainbow is this biblical symbol of hope, right? After Noah's flood, once the water started to subside, once he found land, he saw a rainbow, and it was interpreted to him as being God's promise that this doesn't have to happen again, that the future is okay, right? So uh, uh, image really about America at a turning point, uh, even though we talk about the revolution often, this moment when George Washington steps down is a really important one uh, for American history. We have about five minutes left. I got one last Washington image uh, from down in Richmond um, at the Virginia State House uh, in, in Richmond uh, by a French sculptor, Houdon, who really made his career in France, uh, sculptures of people like Voltaire from the same time period. And this is commissioned while Washington is, actually before he's even in office. The original commission for this uh, was 1784. Okay. Um, and Washington's term is what, 1789 to 1797, right? the two terms. Um, so this is commissioned before that. And it's a slow process for a life-size, over-life-size uh, marble statue. Um, Udon didn't seem to begin serious work on the actual carving until 1788, and it wasn't delivered to the Virginia State House until the last year of Washington's presidency in 1796. Right? So long-term working on it. But the original conception comes out before Washington is even president. And uh, you'll notice that he's carrying a walking stick. Right? It's after he's been general and before he's president. So the idea of laying aside your arms is important here as well. 
And you can see that, in fact, his arms are there. That there's a sword hanging from another bundle of fasces on which he leans his arm, that old Roman symbol. Also hanging from the fasces is a plow. Washington had Mount Vernon at this point. He fancied himself as a gentleman farmer. He had put aside his military career to go back to the farm. Right? When he was left. And in fact, he modeled that activity after a, a famous Roman story of a man named Cincinnatus, after which we get the name of Cincinnati. And in fact, there's a society of the Cincinnati up near the farm. And Cincinnati was a Roman general who was with his followers and saying, please, you know, take over. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm not. Put it all on my shoulders. And Washington is, is put forth as this, the, the modern Cincinnati. Right? He has put aside his sword. He's turning to farm. And just as in the Lansdowne portrait, we saw this famous adage of the pen and the sword. Here we have the sword paired with the plowshare. Now, if you know your Bible there, you will also know that there's a time of peace when we beat our sword into plowshare. We turn the weapon of destruction into a tool of cultivation. And that's the message that's behind the Richmond section of the book. So in all of these images of Washington, Stuart, Mike, uh, Udo, uh, what we're seeing is, is, is an attempt to sort of emphasize certain elements of his character and relate them to the future of America. The last of our pupils of Benjamin West, Udo was not. Is Charles Wilson Peale, and I think we'll talk about him on Tuesday. That, that's too much to talk about. And he's really a great person to talk about when it comes to really seeing uh, 19th century art. Because even though West taught everything, Peale had like 12 kids. Named them Raphael, Rembrandt, Titian. Many of them became artists. They're the first generation that he took into America. And he established the first museum in America, and he established the first art school. So we'll look at him in some depth. We've got some wonderful pictures that relate to his museum. Here is that great painting of the Great Seal as well. And then he has fantastic swords and stuff like that. So we'll look at all this stuff on Tuesday. Okay? Um, when is the first reading? It's not Tuesday, is it? I don't think it's that soon. I'll double check. I'll send you guys an email. Okay? And I'll send you guys a Google poll to try to figure out if I'm going to go down to a meeting with you this month, or this year, I mean. Uh, if we can find a time that works during the week, uh, that would be great, because then we can schedule things, right? And, and just head down there, like maybe on a Friday afternoon or something like that, uh, and go to the Smithsonian American Museum and go to the National Gallery and see these things and talk about them in the galleries rather than in here. That would be much more fun, I think. Okay, guys, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.